are critical minerals the Achilles heel of the energy transition? Climate change deniers will tell you that a zero emissions economy is a pipe dream. They say there's not enough lithium for all the batteries we'll need, that mining rare earth is destroying the environment and that we can't get cobalt without sending children down mines. So is the energy transition doomed before it even begins? Welcome to the Lava Plains in Northeast Queensland. I'm here for a few days for work, taking a look at some of the resources of minerals processing company Lava Blue. I thought this was a great opportunity to make a video about critical minerals. We're going to explore the challenges and opportunities associated with these minerals, and we'll ask the tough questions that will need answers if we're going to pull off the energy transition. I'm Rosie Burns, an engineer with 20 years experience working with clean energy technologies. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. The term critical minerals is bandied around a lot these days. It should be used to describe minerals that are both essential to a nation's economic and strategic interests and at risk of supply disruptions. Basically, you need it and it might become hard to get. Identifying need is usually based on global technology needs such as for advanced manufacturing and defense and most importantly for emissions reduction technologies because our plans for the energy transition require us to move so much faster than these sorts of things tend to naturally develop. A lot of the stuff that we need for that has not been used in much volume before, so there isn't a lot around yet. We're going to need different kinds of minerals and more overall to build the solar panels, wind turbines and electric vehicles and battery storage we need to get to net zero and expansion of the electricity grids to enable that. So that all sounds very simple, but when you look at different published lists of critical minerals, they aren't all the same. Why can't anyone seem to agree on what counts as critical minerals? You need it and it might become hard to get is a simple phrase that hides a lot of ambiguity. Do we really needed or could it be substituted? We used to think we needed cobalt to make lithium ion batteries until lithium ion phosphate batteries got commercialized they don't use any cobalt. And then the second part, it might become hard to get, that can be for a couple of different reasons. It might be scarce or at least scarce in your country, or it might be abundant, but hard to extract and process to a usable form. Lithium is an example of an abundant element that has traditionally been hard to process from most sources. So you can see that what counts as a critical mineral is subjective, depending on who is making the decision and where they are making it. It also depends on when, as new processing methods are being developed all the time and substitutes can often be found and new electricity generation and storage technologies are always emerging. There have always been critical minerals, of course, things that we've needed and had trouble sourcing. For example, in 1924, a copper expert warned the age of electricity and of copper will be short. At the intense rate of production that must come, the copper supply of the world will last hardly a score of years. Our civilization based on electrical power will dwindle and die. In reality, the annual production increased nearly 20 fold in the hundred years since he said that. In a hundred years, do you think that we will look back and think of all this talk of today's critical minerals was stupid? Let's dig a bit deeper. There are dozens of critical minerals, so I won't go through them all just now. I'll just cover the few that are the topic of most contention recently. Lithium, cobalt, and rare earth. For each of these, we'll talk about what they're used for and why they're either hard to find or hard to make or both. I do plan to do whole videos on the most important critical minerals later, so I'll save the deep detail for those videos. If you've got specific questions, then please head to the comments section to tell me. That really helps me out so that I know what exactly to cover in upcoming videos. Let's start with lithium, probably the one that gets talked about the most, including on this channel. You can check out my video with Alex Grant here. Lithium is interesting because it's a key component of lithium ion batteries for use in electric vehicles and stationary storage. But before these technologies, the main use was in medicine. Sometime around the turn of the millennium, batteries took over as the main use, originally in electronics like mobile phones and MP3 players. Batteries take up about 70% of global lithium these days, and now it's mostly in EVs. And that is expected to continue to grow strongly. There are currently few substitutes for lithium that can perform to the same standards in batteries, though emerging technologies such as sodium iron are likely to be ready to replace some of the less demanding battery applications within the next few years. Lithium is not particularly scarce, but it's typically found in low concentrations that are uneconomic to extract. Half of the world's lithium extraction comes from Australia currently, with Chile adding another 20-ish percent. And its processing is even more concentrated, with China processing nearly 60% of the world's lithium and Chile again in second place at nearly 30%. Economically viable sources of lithium include lithium-rich brines, like those in the salt flats of South America, and hard rock minerals like spodumene. But the spike in demand and possible spike in prices has made an incentive to get creative with new sources and new processes, to take it from rock or seawater even and turn it into battery grade lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. 
Next, let's move on to rare earths. Like the term critical minerals, the term rare earths has become a bit of a buzzword lately. But while the minerals that belong in the critical category differ depending on who's categorizing, the same isn't true for rare earths, which have a specific definition. It's a common mistake and a pet peeve of mine that people use both critical minerals and rare earth elements as a synonym just for anything important. It's a little bit wrong for critical minerals and it's a lot wrong for rare earths, which are a group of precisely 17 chemical elements in the periodic table, specifically the 15 lanth plus scandium and yttrium. They have unique electronic, optical, and magnetic properties that are prized in various advanced technologies, including electric motors and generators. Despite their name, they're relatively abundant in Earth's crust, but are often difficult to mine and extract economically due to their dispersion. And there are also often environmentally hazardous processes involved. The main energy transition technologies that rely on rare earths are wind turbines and electric vehicles. That's because rare earths allow the creation of extremely powerful permanent magnets. These magnets are significantly stronger than those made from more conventional materials, which means that they can be smaller and lighter while still providing the necessary magnetic field strength. They are used in permanent magnets for direct drive generators in wind turbines, enhancing efficiency and reliability because these systems require no gearboxes. You mostly see them in offshore turbines where reliability is key because it's so difficult to get maintenance crews out there. Electric motors in EVs often use rare earths in their permanent magnets. These improve EV performance because they're lighter and often more efficient than induction motors that don't use rare earths. In either case, you don't need the rare earths. It's certainly nice to have lighter, more compact motors or generators, but it comes at a cost. Most wind turbines with gearboxes don't use rare earths and Tesla will eliminate them in its next generation vehicles. You might have been surprised to not see batteries on this list of rare earth using technologies. Lithium ion batteries don't use rare earths. And if you thought they did, it's likely because of the tendency of some people to describe any important mineral as a rare earth. Some older battery chemistries like nickel metal hydride did, but as a rule, not lithium ion or sodium ion for that matter. Rare earth minerals are often found in igneous rocks, which are rocks that have formed from the cooling and solidification of molten magma. I'm recording this video in the lava plains, which is just what it sounds like, a region that has had a lot of volcanic activity in the past, and rare earths are one of the expectations for this site. Rare earth minerals are often found in association with other elements such as thorium, uranium, zirconium, and niobium. This is because rare earth elements have similar chemical properties to these other elements, and that can tend to make them hard to separate out. And you might have noticed that some of those elements, specifically thorium and uranium, are radioactive. That adds a whole other layer of headaches. If you're not very careful to avoid it, these radioactive elements will be released into the environment during mining and processing, and they can also be concentrated in the waste products of rare earth processing. This has led to real environmental and human health problems in the regions that mine and process rare earths in China. Finally, we get to cobalt possibly the most controversial of the critical minerals. Like lithium, it's on the critical list because it's in batteries. But before its use in batteries, the main use of cobalt was as a blue pigment in glass, glazes, and ceramics, plus industrial applications like tool steels, magnets, and catalysts. Today is critical because it is a key component in batteries. Cobalt is used in the cathode of many lithium ion batteries because it enables a high energy density and a long cycle life. It's usually found alongside nickel and copper in various ores, and it isn't usually mined by itself. After mining, the ore needs to be crushed, melted down, and treated with chemicals to extract the cobalt. Environmentally, cobalt mining can be disruptive, leading to deforestation, water pollution, and harming ecosystems. It's also energy intensive, which these days still means significant greenhouse gas emissions. But the main controversy surrounding cobalt is due to the social impact. Much of the world's cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the mining practices have been under scrutiny, especially in so-called artisanal mines. Issues range from unsafe working conditions to outright exploitation, including child labor and unfair wages. These serious concerns have led to calls for companies to ensure that their cobalt sources are ethical, pushing for practices that respect human rights and the environment. As I mentioned at the start of this video, there are already new battery chemistries that have been developed that don't use cobalt, and I expect that the extent to which cobalt-containing batteries are used in the future will be closely tied to our ability to extract and process cobalt in socially and environmentally responsible ways. There are a few other critical minerals in this region that I want to quickly mention. Tungsten, known for its high melting point and durability, is used in electronic components, high temperature applications in solar thermal energy, and as a material in wind turbines and nuclear power infrastructure. Alumina in this clay here, which is the company that I'm here with, Lava Blue, is processing into 99.999% pure alumina, aka high purity alumina HPA. That's used in lead lighting and sapphire glass on your phone or smartwatch, and also increasingly in battery separators. 
And to round it out, there are a few important critical minerals that aren't found in this region. Graphite is probably the main one. It's used in the anode of lithium ion batteries. For all of these examples, there are actually plenty of resources available, including the land that I'm standing on right now. However, speed is a big issue. We don't really have time to wait for the normal processes to play out where a new use causes increased demand and then supply shortages and then high prices. High prices make developers keen to bring new mines on, supply goes up and prices come back down again. Unfortunately, in this case, the timeframes don't line up. We are trying to rapidly expand technologies like batteries, electric motors, generators and transmission lines. And that means something in the range of six times as much mineral inputs as we use today. But new mines can can take 16 years to develop and there aren't currently enough new ones in the pipeline to scale clean energy technologies the way we need to to reach net zero at an appropriate time. The IEA notes, for example, that expected supply from existing mines and projects under construction is estimated to meet only half of projected lithium and cobalt requirements by 2030. So more effort is needed globally to ensure enough critical minerals. However, that's not the whole story. It's not enough to have sufficient supplies if they are concentrated in a few places. I'm talking about supply chain security. The production of key minerals for the energy transition, like lithium, cobalt, and rare earth elements, is way more centralized than oil or natural gas production. Just three countries dominate more than 75% of global supply, and sometimes it's almost a one country show. For example, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is pretty much the king of cobalt, supplying 70% of the world's total, while China churned out 60% of all rare earth elements. But digging them out of the ground is just half the story. When it comes to refining these minerals, it's even more concentrated, and here China is really in a league of its own. They handle a staggering 50 to 70% of global lithium and cobalt refining, and for rare earth elements, they're practically a monopoly with 90% control. So what's the worry? Well, with all these eggs in just a few baskets, any disruptions, trade issues, or policy changes in these few key countries could send shockwaves through the whole supply chain. One example of this is when Indonesia banned processed nickel exports in 2020 to encourage investment in the local nickel industry. Another example is a recent coup in Gabon, which had a significant impact on global manganese supply chains. And of course, with 90% of rare earths coming out of China, plus a hefty majority of many other critical minerals, they have the ability to massively disrupt the clean energy plans of pretty much the whole world. In a recent example of that power, in reaction to the US introducing rules trying to stop China from getting or manufacturing chips and components for supercomputers, China introduced an export restriction on gallium. This caused the price to increase by more than 50%. And of course, you can easily imagine the effects of that kind of power play applied in a more widespread manner. It's obviously not a super secure strategy to allow another country to have so much power over your own country's destiny. Everyone is worried about these sorts of issues now. The US has the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, which includes a number of provisions that are aimed at reducing the US's reliance on foreign imports of critical minerals. It includes very generous tax credits for domestic production and processing of critical minerals, international partnerships aimed at friendshoring critical minerals, and funding for research and development in related areas. The EU has also adopted a number of initiatives, including the European Critical Raw Materials Act, the European Battery Alliance, and and the European Green Deal. And other major economies are also working hard to secure their critical mineral supply chains by onshoring, friendshoring, and diversifying. For a country like Australia, this is a huge opportunity. We have all these minerals. We're already mining most of them at scale. Currently, we send the majority offshore for processing, and for some reason, we also send the majority of the profits offshore too because our mines are 86% foreign-owned. This should be the perfect time to change that and keep the value here. Since the mining part of the supply chain will be slow to change, we are in an enviable position to move just a little bit along the value chain and begin to process more of the stuff that we dig up. It makes sense to focus immediate efforts on adding processing to existing mines rather than sending everything to China, as that's something that will fill the gap expected in the next decade before any new resource discoveries made today will have had a chance to come online. So that was a short taster of the issues surrounding critical minerals related to the energy transition. I used an example at the start about an old prediction about copper, that it's going to run out and we wouldn't be able to have electricity anymore. And I wondered whether we'd be saying the same thing about the minerals that I've mentioned in this video. The fact is that the point of identifying lists of critical minerals isn't to predict the future, to be able to look back and say, I told you so. It's to identify bottlenecks ahead of time so that we can either bring more supply online in time or have time to develop alternative technologies that don't rely on problematic supply chains. The company I'm working for, Lava Blue, is one of a number of new companies taking on the challenge of the former, looking for sources of important minerals and developing new processing methods. Tesla is a good example of the latter. They've diverted a lot of their cars to use cobalt-free electricity 
LFP battery chemistry, and they're also developing rare earth free motors that don't compromise too much on performance. I'm going to be working a lot on critical minerals and mining and processing in the future. And as much as possible, I wanna get on site to real projects to be able to show you what that's actually like. If you're a mining or processing company with an interesting project you can let me film, please get in touch. I'd love to make a video about it. Thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team for supporting this channel. If you'd like to join us, we'd love to welcome you. And there's a link in the description. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to leave comments and questions for future videos in the comments. I'll see you in the next video.